Good day, Dan. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. I'm glad to be here, Guy. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. <laughs> I've been meaning to capture uh, you on video here for a number of years, actually. But for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us, first of all, you know, where you grew up and where you went to college before sure. we get into the rest of your life? Sure. Uh, I am... Uh, Presently, I live in Ames, Iowa, but I grew up in Northeast Iowa. I'm a lifetime Iowan, except for a lapse in judgment when I was in college. I spent a couple of summers in Illinois. But generally speaking, I'm an Iowa kid, grew up on a dairy farm in Northeast Iowa, and learned um, a lot. And I'm learning even more as I reflect on that time uh, when I was a kid. I went to college at Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. My undergraduate degree was in speech and theater which is completely related to what I do for a living, sort of. Um, decided that I wasn't finished yet, <clears throat> so I went on to graduate school straight away and got a master's degree in speech communication at the University of Northern Iowa, and then went to work as a speech instructor at the Iowa State University. Uh, did that for a couple of years. Learned that I didn't want to be a uh, faculty member and go into that chase, but I learned what it was gonna require. But I learned that perhaps I have some transferable skills and I went to work in corporate and got my first corporate training and education job back in 1991. Started on the day of the first Gulf War, actually. Uh, they were, we were, the uh, guided bombs were dropping that day and I was in employee orientation. <laughs> very surreal. So where did you go from there? How did you get to where you are today? So I did about 10 years in that first job, and that's when I really became uh, interested in expanding my career in this space of learning and performance improvement. Uh, I would I like to tell people I wasn't closely supervised, so anything that I was interested in that I wanted to go after, my boss would allow me, and there wasn't a lot of budget constraints, so I could go to conferences, I could engage, and I could seek out work at this company, and I uh, learned a great deal about uh, everything related to organizational development, performance improvement, uh, about learning, about leadership development, about, uh, gosh, human resources systems and things. And I found that this work that I do now in business acumen is really where my passion was. And so I started doing some of that late in that career there in the last uh, two or three years where I really started to do that in earnest. And I found that's what I wanted to do. Times got tight for them and it became clear that uh, that uh, the best thing I could do is start my own business, and that started in uh, 2000. Can you tell us a little bit about that business? So that business is a, a business acumen leadership development company, and I focus on uh, the business acumen space. I'm in the space between uh, leadership competency on one side and business results on the other. I like to stay right in that connecting space. Um, I find that if I'm too much on the leadership development, it gets too much too soon, too involved, too competency, too not performance oriented enough. And if I'm too much in the business side of things, there's a disconnect. People say, I don't know how to use it. Thanks for teaching me about the income statement, but I don't influence the income statement. So I got to stay in that space between the two. And I find that that's where the sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. So if you were to give us a, a quick definition of uh, business acumen, what would... Uh what would somebody get if they were to uh, uh, engage you guys? There's some really good ones. Kevin Cope has a nice one that says, uh, understanding the money-making process and working to improve it. That's a nice straightforward one. I like to have a kind of a performance orientation to it where I add uh, that plus uh, making operationally effective and strategically sound decisions. And I like the decision-making component. So that, again, gets me in that space of, oh, I'm a, um, a, a business results or business-oriented leader. That's a competency. But then I got to, like today's world, I've got to focus on cash and cash management. So I need to make the right decisions. So if I'm business-focused and I'm focused on my people or I'm a servant leader, but I still need to get that cash impact, how do I do that? I want to stay in that space. Very cool. So that's how I define it. So your, your company is MDI? It is, Management Development International. Mm -hmm. Good, well, I just want people to be able to go, go find you. Uh, oh, there easily. it is. There you go. So what There are is some... another MDI, this is the correct one. Oh, I see. <laughs> so this is uh, 
Okay, MDI, watch out. There's there's a there's a fake one. There are other ones. Yeah, there are other ones. Yeah. We, probably we're not a uh, IT and outplacement firm, which is another one in Europe somewhere. Ah, I see. <laughs> yes, you're a Midwestern boy, and that's where MDI is located. Uh, can you share with us some of the more interesting uh, projects that you've worked on over the course of your career? Sure. Um, let me check. I made a few notes on this. Um, early on, and again, this is a, a word to those that are early starters in this kind of uh, consulting business. You know, you think you want to strike out on your own. Your first couple of clients are quite memorable. And, you know, they're just like, wow, they could have chosen anybody and they picked me. And that's what got me started. Um, I was involved with a large mortgage financing organization of, uh, to train loan officers. Um, and that was a phenomenal project. Essentially, my friend and colleague was who worked there was handed a box full of videotapes of a guy's presentation, this expert that they had hired and videotaped. And she knew darn well that that was not going to be effective, just sending out videotapes to all the loan offices. So she said, I've got to make a silk purse out of this. Can you help me make this into some kind of sales improvement instruction that actually might move the needle? And uh, I said, absolutely. And uh, it was, a, I think it was maybe 15 or 16 20-minute modules of this gentleman speaking direct to camera in a auditorium setting, kind of a motivational speaker sort of thing. And we worked that summer not only to design it, but to create uh, management modules, management support, create uh, infrastructure, uh, maybe managing some of the institutional barriers to some of the more uh, controversial things like needs-based selling, uh, maybe a little bit of spin in there. There's a little bit of spin, a little bit of sales support and coaching feedback loops, interviewing skills, some of these things just were not part of their culture. Um, rates were low, so they were selling a lot of mortgages with just rates. Mm -hmm. They wanted it to be more values-based, and so that was a big change. Um, so we created uh, all of these things, plus the rollout and the cascading, and uh, it was a, I learned a ton. I just learned a ton going through this entire project. But it all started with a conversation with a client saying, I don't know if you do this, but I'm between a rock and a hard place. And she's kind of saying, Dan, you have to. You have to mm -hmm. help me. Well, very cool. And, of course, when you were referring to spin, you're referring to spin selling by Neil Rackham. Yes. yes. Needs-based right. selling, yes. Yeah, and I didn't know I was doing it at the time. But that you know, the more I learned, the more I realized you know, the wisdom of those uh, principles applied in the selling context, of mm -hmm. course. Um. There was another project where I was doing some business acumen as I talk about being in this space between business result and competency, and that was back at my old job. And I didn't know I was doing it at the time. You know, I was, like I said, I was unsupervised. So I just got influenced by smart people. And I said, well, this is the way to do it. Well, I'll go ahead and try it. And what, it, what I found in that whole process of, of middle management development was to lighten up on my 360 and my competency and my, you know, uh, stewardship kind of content. And uh, here are great leadership models of wonderful leaders that we can all reflect on and talk more about, hey, the business needs you to change your conversations. And if you're not confident in these conversations and having regular one-on-ones, we need to help you with that. Mm -hmm. Let's try it. Let's support it. And let's give you stuff to talk about. And that changed my whole approach to leader development, really getting off this soapbox of trait and more on the focus on, hey, uh, you know, have you met with your people individually? Mm -hmm. No. They need you to talk to them. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep it simple, but let's keep it powerful. Very cool. So those are a couple of early projects that got me to learn the power of, you know, good performance improvement tactic widely deployed, has the best impact. Well, that's a great segue into my next question, which is, uh, can you share with us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or sure. evidence-based practices for performance improvement, 
or HPI human performance improvement or PT performance technology or we got lots of different names right. for this thing. But yeah. can, can you share with us? So how, how did you come across this? What was uh, what's the story about that? Well, early on in my career, I wanted more. So I started exploring what it meant to be a good instructional designer. And I was developing myself to be a good designer of good training. And in that context, I was felt a little bit wanting with some of the professional societies or some of these others who were, um, uh, you know, these HR groups and others. And I was really drawn to being kind of a data and analytics. I think at my heart, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I'm a bit of a quant. And so I wanted more that was more data-driven and evidence-based. Again, I didn't have the language for it at the time. So a colleague who was in IT, who is training IT uh, folk, uh, said, you know, this." I went to the ISPI conference and I never went outside the entire time. I was inside. I went outside. I didn't even know what the weather was because everything was just so good for me. I never went anywhere other than talking to the people. So I went. And that's when we um, really began to appreciate the evidence-based practice the collaborative nature of these professionals and how um, focused they were on usability of what they were doing. Uh, you know, some of them were a little bit cranky about it, and I like that was endearing to me. <laughs> but still, a lot of them were solving real-world problems. And then once they saw it, they were frustrated with others. They just said, don't you see the real impact we're having? And um, that was very... Uh, very good for me. So then I got involved. I got very involved with my local chapter. I got involved with the society at the national level. I got involved with the chapter partnership committee. Uh, I think you even recruited me to join the board at one point. Um, and so I got very involved with things and it was very instructive for me as I was working at this company, but also then for me to kind of sorting out how do I want to position my own consulting practice in that space that I was describing and how do I deploy these uh, these resources. So early on, um, people like, uh, I think Judy Hale is one, Harold Stolovich never missed his presentations because of his transition in that space between the learning and practice research and the data-driven approach to like, turning that around into how that will influence how you do instructional design. I remember a very powerful fluency conversation I had with Carl Binder, who him influencing me on charting performance. Uh, there were several of those that were happening. And I, I hit ISPI at the time where the people who studied with, you know, Ogden Lindsley and, and Bill Detterline and did this work with, <laughs> with, uh, with the founders of performance technology, but now are the next generation. And that's where, you know, I didn't know any of those people in person but I knew their influence on these individuals. Uh, Allison Rosette, living in the, you know, I think it's Arizona State. Is that not correct, guys? San Diego she's State. Arizona she's a, State. She's, yeah, she's retired San Diego from San Diego. State. So anyway, being in that space of being a, uh, you know, an academic uh, mm -hmm. and trying to influence, you know, academic programs, which, you know, is, again, near and dear to my heart. Uh, and, of course, the playfulness of Tiagi, again, living in that, hey, let's have a great time, but let's be performance-based about it with our games and simulations and have that learning be playful. Uh, that really was uh, another key influencer of mine. So um, those are just a few names at the time. Those are sessions that I wouldn't miss. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions follow-up uh, to this is that, uh, how, so how do you refer to it? Do you call it HPT, Human Performance Technology, or you know, when you're talking to your clients or whatever, how do you refer to this thing? I refer to it as evidence-based practice. That seems to get a nod like you're giving me. Mm -hmm. uh, I try not to refer to it too much because it's like, well, what is, what is a, uh, someone, like I'm a CPT, so I will say, well, I'm a CPT. I put it on my name because I worked hard to earn it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what we do. We're weird. We ask a lot of questions on the front end. You will see me kind of explain myself if I'm in a seminar. I will explain it because I feel like I have to. I explain and maybe that's ruining it for everybody because when you explain a joke, it's not <laughs> funny anymore. <laughs> 
But this is why we're doing, uh, you know, these quizzes. This is why we're doing these recall exercises. This is why we're doing simulation and that you are, you know, you have a problem remembering it all because it's too much cognitive load. I will explain those things because, mm-hmm. shoot, this is just who I am. I have to. Uh, but that said, um, I will refer to it as evidence-based practice. I'll refer to it as performance technology and performance consulting. Or I will just use the word performance-based uh, as and try to keep it simple language mm-hmm. and simple principles. Um, but when, you know, when we're with our own kind, we talk about HPT as shorthand. Yeah, we use our jargon, but... Uh... So I've had other people make the suggestions, as you are, that, you know, they really kind of downplay it. They don't emphasize it because then you have to get into the whole, you know, how do you define the word technology? Is that computers or the application of science? Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah, we've um, learned, all learned that lesson. We sure have. Yeah. So my second uh, follow-up question to that was that you have mentioned uh, a bunch of people who were influential to you in the early days uh, as you entered into all of this. But are there... Articles or books that you would point new people to that, uh, you know, somebody starting off that, you know, these these people, Judy Hale, Tiagi, et cetera, Carl Binder, those would be good people to check in on. And are, but there are there any, is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of articles or books that? Uh, sure. In today's day and age, I mean, when people are asking me, how do I get up to speed quickly and you know they really are sincere in their interest to put a little effort into it so that's the qualification you have to put well who else can I read well you can send them a bibliography and they file it so it's like really in earnest what do you want to read so I will send them to specific things in um, in it for Will Thalheimer's compendium of research to practice Mm -hmm. I mean he's done a nice job of putting everything in one place but I think I have to curate that sometimes and say, well, you know, what is it that you really want to do? Is it on the instructional side, e-learning side? Maybe I'll do the e-learning manifesto. Um, I will try to kind of steer people on a one-on-one basis to the kind of thing that they seem to be most interested in. Um, I would also suggest that if you ask someone like us to do that for you, I have learned that I will ask for follow-up. Hey, go do that, and then let's talk. Yeah. What did you get from it? Mm-hmm. Did you find it too much buzzwords, too academic, too in the weeds? Do we need to back up a little bit, you know, that kind of thing uh, to really provide for you? Uh, I find that it, that's, you know, we need to close a little. We need to really do have that feedback loop. Oh, that's, a, that's, um, that's good advice. Uh, I find that, yeah, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say that's good advice to do the follow up because, uh, you know, otherwise you get uh, you sometimes begin to feel like you're wasting your time making referencing people to, you know, other people, books, sure. articles, and things like that. And, you know, what are they doing with it? So, adding a yeah. little peer pressure, seeing what, you, what you get from that, that's a, that's a great yeah. idea. Thanks. But I've also learned that nobody's like me. Because, you know, if you gave me a book guide to read, I would go read it. Mm-hmm. Or at least I would buy it and I would go through it as a, because I'm, that way, and I've learned that you know, not everybody's like that. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is another huge lesson it's, learned yes. that you know don't assume that everybody is just like you or exactly. us. Exactly. All right, let me switch gears here again. Now, again, we're trying to uh, tr- we're trying to provide some examples to our audience, and I'm assuming that many of the people in the audience are mm-hmm. people new to the field. So. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Sure, sure. And it's related to what I said in my opener. So uh, I put a little thought into it. I got to jot it down here. And if it is part of uh, kind of my conversation that I have with people. Uh, and it starts off like this. Not enough leaders see the bigger picture of business and performance. So that's where I live. I provide compelling and relevant learning in business acumen, and that enables those operationally effective and strategically sound decisions. I give lots of practice, I give lots of feedback, and I give lots of opportunity for them to show what they know and what they can do. So that's how I give my elevator speech. Mm -hmm. That usually ends up with a, oh, tell me more what you mean. I said we use simulators, 
We use a lot of coaching and feedback. We collaborate with your learning and development experts. You know, big companies have a lot of L&D. Small companies have an HR person, usually mm -hmm. one. <laughs> but nonetheless, they'll use a bunch of principles uh, to get this, get this done. And that seems to give enough kind of plain language to give the conversation started. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah, the plain language aspect of that. And, uh, um, you know, let, giving people just enough so that if they truly are interested, they'll ask for more. Of course. Thank you for that. Um, sure. As a lifelong learner, can you share with us, uh, you know, what you're focused on for your current learning or your next learning? And uh, with that, are, are you writing about any of this? What can you share with us about uh, you know, your own sure. pursuits and learning? So when I'm able, I do blog, and I blog relatively infrequently. Not frequent enough to be, really think I am a blogger. Um, but at my website, mdi-learning.com, I have a blog that I started actually with my ATD chapter when they had a week, no, a monthly newsletter. Remember those where they would print yeah. them out and mail them? Ah, so quaint. And I had a column called Business Learning by Dan. And my job was to take business learning and connect it to training and development. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a few of those columns, maybe a dozen or so. And so that was my jumping off point to create an online blog. And so uh, I pu published to that. Uh, probably once or two, I'm probably going to need to do this more frequently. I won't even tell you how very infrequent it is. But nonetheless, I try to take a, that, that performance view of uh, business acumen and leader development. Sometimes I'll take a topic that's related to uh, learning uh, and snake oil or learning and actual impact, uh, but also uh, a little bit on business acumen or a business topic that seems to have relevance that I've learned or most recently, I just kind of had an insight about how business acumen helps you make connections and see the bigger picture, and that that's a cognitive science thing about how we draw conclusions in our in our our uh, thinking patterns. So I just kind of blogged a little bit about that most recently. Uh, so, so what are you? So, what's your focus now for your own learning? Uh, are, is there a particular topic or yeah, thing yeah. that you're going after? So, there, there are. Um, yeah, it's related to these topics. So I've engaged with my local chapter of ATD and gotten myself involved. They have a couple of really uh, vibrant events and practices that they've got going on, a, an annual conference of sorts of a day, and I got on the committees there. I raised my hand for programming, so I've been the programming chair for that the last several years, and it's been working. I like to take credit for it to myself. But uh, it all started two or three years ago, and I went to the conference, and I'm like, this is vendors just trying to get you to buy their stuff. And I'm like, it's nice and everything, but no, 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 no. This really isn't helpful to the members. And trying to get a member performance orientation to the programming of the day, and um, I've learned a ton with that, not only in getting the right people in front of our members, but also learning from them because they've got great evidence-based, client-based, you know, problem-solving that they're doing and have, getting great results and award-winning stuff. And so that's been really great. So like, for example, later this afternoon, we will have a what, what they're calling a pop-up session online. They announced it two or three days ago, and we are all getting online and we're all talking about how we're dealing with the uh, pandemic and what it's meaning to us to work from home. That's the most tangible thing that we're talking about, but more to the point is how do we support one another? What do we want to hear from each other during this time of really extraordinary uncertainty? What what are you doing a lot of? What do you need help with? And how can we be of help to one another? Um, and it's kind of a pop-up session. And uh, I'm, we'll see. Uh, they announced it just two or three days ago. But that's the kind of thing that I want to be involved in. I want to see and learn and help. Uh, that's one of our, our um, help me guy. It's one of our CPT <coughs> principles. It's one oh, of, yeah. The, yeah. Yes. Be helpful. One of the standards. Standards. There we go. I was trying to find the right word. Yeah. Standards. And so <clears throat> that's what I'm doing. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And uh, 
Okay, let's shift gears here. Uh, my next question is, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And I only set this up because in our field, in the profession, we have language issues. We have dozens of labels, words for the same thing and, uh, uh, and the opposite. So we're opportunity rich in cleaning up our language. And so one of the things I found out uh, 12 years ago when I first started this is that people have some fire in their belly about certain terms and how they're being used. Sure. And so uh, this is a little platform here for you to put your spin on something. Perhaps you feel that the term or phrase is being misused or misconstrued. Okay. Or there's some issue with it. So wh what performance improvement term or phrase might you define for us? And if you have more than one, go ahead. Okay, the first one that came to mind is retrieval practice. That's the first one that came to mind. Mm -hmm. So that's what I thought I would talk about. So first, a little context. Um, I agree. We have difficulty in our profession being an evidence-based performance improvement. Uh, where's your data? Data is plural. All of that. And we have difficulty translating that into our practices. Many of us have done so with clients that are very patient and understanding with us. And so there's lots of lots to learn there. Um, I think also new people might be a little intimidated. I'm not sure what to try or how to use it. And I have discovered early, early on, try it. And you will you know, fail fast to use an agile project principle. Uh, and be sure to learn the lesson and get going with it. So I used retrieval practice in one of my sessions. I called it that. And I got no effect, frankly, in one of my sessions. And I realized I was calling it the wrong thing. And I said, hey, do you, get it? Do you have to remember things for your work? Yeah. Do you believe in this idea that, you know, practice makes perfect and perfect practice makes perfect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That all, lots of nods, you know, and we learned those principles in our, I had a group of trainers in my session. And I said, well, then it stands to reason that if we want people to remember things, they should practice remembering them so that they're not sitting there trying to remember when you want them to answer the phone properly or you want them to... Uh, lead a good one-on-one -on -one, or to do a good employment interview or you want them to do a good inspirational speech. And I'm like, heavens, good gracious, don't we think we need to get those fundamentals? Again, this is the thing I learned from Carl Binder is these component skills build the composite. So the component is I got to remember it first and then I can learn that composite skill of having a good interview. Of course, none of that I could say out loud, except I could say it to you, but that's all the composite component, but. So it's like we should practice remembering. So that's why I live on this world of retrieval practice. And I think a good working definition, and I jotted it down, is bringing information to mind often. Bringing information to mind often to aid in the long-term remembering of it. So delivery, and then, of course, the evidence supports that if we deliberately do so, our awareness and accuracy of our own competence makes us more confident. And as I learned again from Carl Binder, it's about confidence and competence. If I feel competent and confident in using Zoom, I'll do it more often. If I feel confident and competent working from home, I'm going to do it and I will solve problems with it. I will be able to take on something else because I feel confident about it. And it only is in my own. And we learned, who are the researchers that told us that learning is personal? It's not something that is everybody learned it. Learning is a personal thing. We, you, you get the aha when you get the damned aha. You see the, the faces, the vases when you see them. You don't see them before. Um, one of my uh, 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 content partners is Selene. And they provide business acumen and business learning solutions. And they use a lot of simulators. But they're based on this principle of the aha. And they use this puzzle where you see, we, we like to, we all refer to it as seeing the cow. Because it's just a bunch of dots. It looks like a Rorschach test until you see it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put the FedEx logo in front of people. Do you see the arrow? Yes, I see the arrow now. Do you see the arrow in the guy? Do you see it when you look at FedEx? I do not. Well, next time you see it, you'll see the arrow, and now you <laughs> yeah, it will see it. Okay, so that's learning. You, you got it. 
That's the aha. And, and retrieval practice for me is a way in my profession to give people those fluency and those fundamental skills of knowing when to see it. They see it when they see it, whether that's a problem in their working ca working uh, capital or their free cash flow is not high enough or their um a key indicator on the KPI is in a danger zone or is something we need to pay attention to. Well, that's because you see the connection. Can you help others see it? That's that's where I work. So that's how I use retrieval practice, giving people enough practice to look at it, to have confidence and competence in seeing these business information, business data, accounting data, and so forth. Thank you. That's excellent. Sure. Uh, do you have any others that you'd like to, or shall we move on? I think that's the main one. I mean, <laughs> I could go on about, uh, golly, there's other ones. Cognitive load is another one. Then, like, confirmation bias. Don't get me started on confirmation bias these days. <laughs> so we can move on. So All right. If, if you care, you can look it up. You can Google it, right? And then, and then reach out to me, and we can have a coffee. And I'll there tell you, you why I have a carpenter's coffee mug. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> we discussed that. All right, so let's uh, segue to the next question, sure. which is kind of a follow-on from one of the earlier ones. Earlier, I asked about, you know, so who are your er uh, biggest influencers early on, people, articles, books. But now let's explore some of the people who maybe have uh, been more of a more recent influence sure. And people that you'd like to call out, and what I'm looking for is, uh, you know, stories or call outs of individuals. And uh, before we hit the record button, you gave me a bunch of names, so I've got these here sure. written down in front of me. So in case you were to forget, yeah. So who who would you like to share uh, some stories or? Well, I just made a note to myself to make sure I don't forget that one. Um, you know, it's interesting. That's funny how your brain works, right? It's like, oh, I gotta, I have to, uh, yeah. I have to mind map this or it'll be gone. Um, the thing about uh, thinking about influentials, you know, it's uh, we're on the shoulders of giants, aren't we? You know, um, and they're quite influential to me. And I hope that 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 is inspirational to anybody who's watching this is that the more you learn, the more giving these people are, the more success you have, the more you like to do it. And, you know, I will start with you, Guy, reaching out to do this type of thing on your own nickel, on your own dime. You've you've got plenty to do. You know, you can. You live in a wonderful state. You're out in a beautiful countryside. There's all kinds of wonderful things. You get the grandkids going, and you're taking your time to do this. So I really want to appreciate that. Um, I have had those kind of mentors and influencers uh, early on, even when I was in college, being a theater kid. Uh, so I want to start, too, with the Striblings. Believe it or not, Don and Loretta Stribling and their commitment to us as young theater kids who were undisciplined but maybe had some talent and put us into the plays, gave us more responsibility than we probably should have had. I couldn't follow up. I couldn't sew straight. I couldn't darn a sock. And Loretta taught me how to stitch correctly. Uh, you get up here in this costume shop or you're going to go on stage naked was her influence to me. <laughs> Uh, Don, uh, you know, take my note. I don't want to give you a note twice. So I learned about feedback and taking it and changing your performance, your literal onstage performance from taking the feedback from them, but also their passion, their pride in us when uh, we were able to assemble something that resembled art and their, their cup, their picture of pride that they felt for us. So that's early on influencer, Don and Loretta Stribling at Loris College, the Loris Players, very, very much uh, influential for me. And those stakeholders and those people that influenced me now still influenced me then. I mean, I mentioned those names early on at the ISPI conference and the example they set. I think of Bill Detterlein being, you know, so glad to see me on our way to the conference we were at the same gate. He lived here in Iowa and we were going to the conference and he invited me into the United Club. I was a young kid with no status with United. And I was like, wow, look at this beautiful, I don't know, it was a single room at the Des Moines airport and there were sodas there. And they were like, wow, you don't have to buy your soda. And look at this wonderful, <laughs> the inner sanctum of status. And uh, nonetheless, you know, his time with me and his good nature, his crankiness 
I just loved it all. I just sat and listened. And um, his advice to me was to listen to these folks and to uh, and to be be so supportive of them. And that's what I like to do too. So that's influenced me now. And so that's why it's so much fun for me to sit and chat with you guy about stuff like this. Um, people nowadays that that are extending the same sort of ethic, if you will, uh, the first name that comes to mind are people like Walt, Will, uh, I'm sorry, Will Thalheimer and his Debunker Club. He put this out and I was one of the first to join it. And I wanted to live. What is this about trying to get people to straighten out and stop with some of the myths of things? And then how do we get, how do we approach them? How do we use some of the things that we know to, to deal with confirmation bias or, uh, uh, you know, some of these things like um, sunk cost thinking or, you know, this loss aversion? I have this idea and you're telling me that it's incorrect. I feel a painful loss. The dopamine hits me in the wrong. You know, how do we help people through the change of saying, you know, really, even though these smart people are using Dale's cone and you, all you did was, you know, share it online, you still need to stop sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the defense mechanism that kicks in. Learned a lot from Will and uh, kind of having a playful debunker club sort of uh, method to that. Uh, Clark Quinn and uh, the silliness of his book around the goldfish. He put the goldfish on the cover. Uh, yeah, that was his, um, I guess, windmill. For us, perhaps, it's learning styles that we're tilting at. He's tilting at that stupid goldfish meme that came from Microsoft. We don't have the attention span of a goldfish. No, we don't. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the people nowadays. Um, Will has also kind of reminded us all that let's do what works rather than just poke out things that don't work. And so we have to have a, well, what do you do instead? And I find that that's a much more productive conversation with people, especially my ATD friends. They want to, well, all right, then, if this isn't it, uh, just having an interactive experience. No, 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 it's interactive that's performance-based and authentic and relevant well, what do you mean? Okay, so then I'm getting to Mike Taylor, who's one of the best curators of this resources, these resources online for e-learning, for cognitive processes and instruction through e-learning technique and, and um, you know, whether it's formal or informal, whether it's an e-learning program or, uh, uh, gee, how do you even do a good conference call with people? Uh, how do you make a good uh, design choice on your on your PowerPoint slides. Um, Will is doing some great work nowadays on just kind of the science of presentation, which is debunking a bunch of myths about PowerPoint bullets, you know, and, and things like this. You know, we, we sometimes get it stuck in the weeds of these debates, but still very helpful stuff uh, for me. So Mike is very influential, but he's also standing on uh, Ruth Colvin Clark and her science of instruction, because she was one of the early ones who were writing about that for us in the data. Uh, and that's going all the way back to, uh, you know, early CBT and what we used to call multimedia, uh, you know, building on some of these psychological principles of cognitive load and, you know, Carl Winder telling us again about um, uh, recall and about uh, reading and see and say and all of this alignment that we need to do. So all of this stuff is really still still as relevant today that I see in some of these people. Ruth Clark, uh, Patty Shank is doing some great, great work in writing, writing for instruction and remembering. So again, let's, you hear me talk about using simple and concrete language and all of us trying to take the lessons of Patty in our own um, our own, uh, uh, you know, how we even talk about ourselves and how we even present ourselves to our, to our colleagues and trying to do good work. I think she has a lot, lot a lot to offer. And uh, another one that I'm following online is a gentleman named Blake Howard. And again, he's a bit of a curator of sorts. He's a teacher, an educator. Um, you know, what do we call it? You know, the, the person who gets up and entertains and maybe has an informative thing, it's inspirational, we call it like an edutainer, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like that is almost a, a, uh, a, you know, a bad thing to be called. You know, I don't want to be an edutainer. I want to have more impact. Um, 
he calls it an, uh, what is it? A, uh, I'll, I'll have to think of it. It's not coming, but he has a word for his too in the education space. So a teacher, you know, will go to in service and hear somebody inspirational, right? And then they were like, oh, and then it's just junk. And so he's he's tilting at those windmills, if you will, for uh, teachers and educators. So his name is Blake Howard. So those are some of the folks nowadays that I'm using to influence me. And I'm influenced also by my confirmation bias because they, you know, they're my people. So I want, oh, yeah, there's another good argument to make my point. And I'm like, you know, that's why I like following some of the educators because the educators are coming back with, Okay, um, I'm online and I've got too much color in my presentation, but I've paced, I'm, I'm challenged by using this stuff and I want to use ready-made and some of the ready-made has design flaws in it, so help me. And, uh, you know, we want to be agile, so gosh, you know, uh, ready now is better than perfect later. And let's be kind to one another, you know, let's assume uh, good intent and uh, etc. So I'm learning a bunch of stuff from all of these people that, uh, you know, you, you, mindless adherence to dogma doesn't serve, you know, perhaps some of our early, uh, our early researchers in performance improvement got a little too cranky because we weren't doing it the way we should have. We were too linear. We were too cranky about it. And sometimes we just have to have a little bit of a sense of humor and give people a, a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I've learned over the years. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Sure. As we uh, shift here to wrapping up our interview, um, again, thanks so much for doing this with me. But for our audience, especially uh, uh, new people, new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for them? You know, what would your counsel be to somebody coming into the business? Yeah. Um, how can you help them? I guess the most important thing I would say is try it. Don't wait for someone to give you permission. Don't wait for someone to ask you. So if you find something that's clever, in, uh, insightful, a, a design characteristic, a, uh, an idea, a tool, then use it. Figure out how to do it and use it. And then if someone says, this was very strange, I loved this. Uh, first time I used flashcards is an example of that. I learned that from Carl Binder telling me about fluency building through practice of recall. I did flashcards was with the sales organization and it was product information. And they loved it and we had games with it. And I got such positive response and it was a simple technique. And that really taught me that, you know, just try it. Try, change your interview questions when you're doing needs assessment. You know, follow uh, some of the work of Allison Rosette and some of the ready now stuff that she had about doing it fast. So that would be my overall learn from us that have tried things and got evidence and then do it. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Dan? So, uh, thank you again so much for doing all of this and sharing your wisdom and insights. I found this uh, I, I found this uh, a great interview. My I'm, pleasure. I'm so happy that we finally connected and did this. Here. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks for all of your prep and coaching. Good luck. Thank you, everybody.